Right, guys, everyone, thank you for um, coming here tonight. Um, thanks for coming week nine. I know it can be a bit stressful. Um, what we've got um, tonight, we've got Peter Tatchell here, who's um, a politician, a uh, political activist. Um, he's going to be talking um, on the topic of Britain being an economic dictatorship, and he's going to advocate for why we need an economic democracy. Um, this talk tonight is being filmed by um, Raw Radio Warwick, who are going to be filming and distributing this. Um, and also, I'd just like to add as well, we're doing a chat Kira, our charity um, exec member for the PP Society, is doing a, a charity collection for um, Mind and Community Refugee and Migrant Centre. Um, so please donate kindly for that. This event's done not just the PP Society, it's done with the Politics Society as well, who have an event to organise, uh, to advertise at the end as well. So if everyone could give a massive round of applause to um, Peter Tatchell. Welcome to tonight's lecture, which is on the theme of Britain is an economic dictatorship, time for economic democracy. Now my starting point is very simple. We expect political democracy, why not economic democracy as well? Imagining a society where the economic system was in closer democratic alignment with the political system seems perfectly reasonable and plausible. Yet it's not on anybody's political agenda. I find that strange. Um, extending the franchise economically, to me, makes sense. It makes democratic sense. It's a simple matter of justice and fairness, which would help lay the foundations for a more equitable society and a more constructive partnership between capital and labour, between employees and those who hold managerial and shareholder positions. I want to have a chance to imagine what society could be. Too often we just accept society as it is. It's great that parties like Labour are proposing a challenge to austerity, who break their defending public services. But I think we need to go one step further. We need to challenge the economic structure of society. We need to question who has economic power and how that power is exercised. And that means questioning and imagining a different way of organising the levers of economic power. It means upscaling economic participation, accountability, transparency and decentralisation. To get away from the top-heavy pyramid we have at the moment, where a tiny, tiny minority of people the major shareholders, managers and directors hold all the economic power while the mass of people, both in private institutions and in public services like the National Health Service, have no economic power at all. That is not democratic. Now, a form of economic democracy is, in my view, possible. <coughs> but we have to imagine it. We have to think about it. We have to devise what that might be. And I think that nobody, even the defenders of the current system, can possibly claim that the current economic model is democratic. It is a system of economic dictatorship, characterised by a lack of democracy, a lack of participation, a lack of transparency, and a lack of accountability. Employees are frozen out of economic decision making. Within the existing system, which too many people take for granted, big business rules. And even the public services are run on big business lines. So local councils, the National Health Service and other public institutions 
have the same kind of top-heavy administration, where the people at the top make all the decisions and the ordinary employees have no meaningful say. If we look at private enterprise, we can see that the captains of industry, commerce and finance have almost total power. <coughs> they run their enterprises on quasi totalitarian lines. They make all the decisions. They're not accountable to consumers. They're not accountable to employees. They can make decisions affecting millions of people's lives and yet those people who are affected don't have any meaningful input. So the economic system that we live under is very much concentrated in the hands of a tiny privileged elite of shareholders, directors and managers. And that is in complete contrast to the one person, one vote principle that characterises our political system. In our economic system, the top brass have all the votes and the vast majority of people have no vote. They decide on hiring and firing, pricing, investment, technology. They decide everything. And the people at the grassroots get to decide nothing. They are subject to a totalitarian system of economic uh, dictatorship. Let's just look at the statistics for wealth and power in our society. Back in 2010, the richest 1,000 individuals in Britain had a combined personal wealth of £335 billion. Last year, it had increased to £575 billion. This year, it's gone up to £658 billion. The 1,000 richest people in Britain have a combined personal wealth of £658 billion. Pounds. The poorest 50% in Britain have less than 10% of the national wealth. Of all the land in Britain that's in private ownership, 1% own 70%. You can get my drift. There are huge economic disparities. And the economic system we have sustains those inequalities. It's a structural system that perpetuates great wealth for a handful at the expense of the vast majority. So there are deep, deep flaws in our economic system. What might be the alternative? Well, I certainly don't have all the answers. I haven't got a perfect blueprint, but I'd like to suggest tonight some fragments of what an alternative economic democracy might look like. And I'm sure greater minds than mine will come up with even better ideas. But let's have the conversation. Let's imagine what could be rather than simply accept what is. So I've got four ideas, four very simple, easy ideas. The first is, we need to have a check and balance on the abuse of economic power. And one way to do this would be to make corporate negligence and recklessness an explicit criminal offence. So you're familiar, I think, with what happened with the Royal Bank of Scotland and Northern Rock in 2007 and 2008. The managers, the directors, the major shareholders made reckless, irresponsible economic investment decisions, which resulted in those banks failing and it almost brought down the entire British economy. I think the directors and managers responsible for those choices should have been held personally liable. Because if they had been, if they knew that they could personally answer for their actions by bearing the personal cost of the financial losses and facing the prospect of prison, I bet they would have not taken those foolish, reckless investment decisions. 
I think that if criminal actions, if corporate recklessness and negligence was a criminal offence, it would help ensure more responsible economic management and act as a deterrent to those who would gamble with the economy for personal gain. I don't believe that bankers and big company bosses should be able to wreck our economy and then get away with it. I don't think they should be able to take decisions for which they have no accountability and no comeback. I don't think they should be allowed to squander people's jobs, pensions and savings with impunity, which is what the Northern Rock and RBS directors did. As I said, I think they should be held personally liable for damaging corporate decisions in the same way that doctors, solicitors and other professionals could be held liable for negligence. I think you can be pretty sure that the threat of legal penalties, including personal financial payback and prison, would result in more prudent corporate governance. Another proposal I'd suggest is that all medium and large sized companies and public institutions like the National Health Service should be required by law to have on their management boards one third employee elected directors and independent directors appointed to represent the interests of consumers. I think we need to have a counterbalance to corporate power at the board level. Now, this is not such a radical idea. In Germany, they have a works council system where there's a partnership between capital and labour. It's not as radical as what I would like to see, but it does result in greater workplace fairness and it also results in better industrial relations. <laughs> On the whole, Germany has fewer strikes, it's a more productive economy, and part of the reason is because there's a better partnership between the managers and directors, the shareholders, and the employees. So if it works in Germany, why can't a similar system work here? We know that where employees feel they have a real stake in their enterprise, whether it be, you know, BP, or it be the local council. Where they have a stake, they will be more happy, content, satisfied, and productive employees. So, industrial democracy, workplace democracy, is not only an issue of fairness, it's also an issue of goodness for the economy. And of course, not being so driven by the profit motive, employee and consumer directors could push for workplace policies and decisions that are more socially inclusive and responsible. You know, safeguarding equal opportunities, environmental rights, ensuring that we end the disparity between London and the South East and the rest of the country. They could also act as watchdogs or whistleblowers <coughs> against corporate irresponsibility to help prevent the implementation of harmful boardroom decisions. As I said, if we had directors from the workforce and from consumer organisations on the boards of RBS and Northern Rock, you can bet they would have blown the whistle about those bad investment decisions, which would have saved those banks and saved the co economy of this country from the devastation it experienced post-2008. Another idea is to break up the unhealthy concentration and centralization of economic power. And one way to do this would be to establish employee mutual societies to give their members control of their own pension funds. At the moment, pension funds are hired off to private corporations <coughs> who invest pensions.
intentions based upon their own corporate agenda. I think there's a very strong case for saying that the pensions belong to the members. The members should have direct or ultimate control over those investment decisions. Now currently, employee pension funds amount to around about £1,000 billion. That's about a third of the entire stock market. So if control of these pension funds were given to employee mutual societies, that would act as a countervailing force against the interests of purely private capital. It would give ordinary people an input a stake in investment decisions, and they could use that power to make investment decisions that better suited their members. Now, of course, when it comes to pensions, employees are going to want to get the best possible return. But not if it means hiving off money to China or India when there's a need for investment at home in the local community which would benefit everybody directly. So, for example, in the North East, there are parts of the North East which are very run down. Massive underinvestment. If there are employee mutual societies in the North East, they could choose to invest their pension money in the local community to revitalise their own communities, which in the long term would be beneficial not only for the pension contributors, but their families, friends and whole communities. I think it's really, really important that we get away from the idea that big money knows best, that corporate interests have all the answers, that they alone have the wisdom and the ability to make good investment and pension. Of course, employee mutual societies should get expert financial advice, but they should have the ultimate power to decide. So, you know, an employee controlled pension fund might be incentivized to operate in ways that help make the economy more people centered, more public welfare oriented, more mindful of environmental consequences, more supportive of marginalised communities. Hopefully, they might invest less in the arms trade and clothing and sweatshops, and they might be more open to investing in decisions that meet the social needs of their members. In new renewable energy, new medical technologies, affordable housing, investment in new local jobs in run-down deprived communities. And this can only happen if the employees themselves have a meaningful, direct say in how their pension funds are invested. <coughs> the final example I give is another example of how we could devolve and democratise economic power. And the idea is to create a scheme of employee share ownership or employee share funds which would be collectively held and administered uh, on behalf of all staff in an enterprise. Uh, again, it would be through a system of employee mutual societies. Now, under this idea, private share capital companies would be obliged by law to assign these employee mutual societies a proportion of their annual profits in the form of a new share issue, or in terms of a cash payment. The idea is that if a company performs well, if it increases its profits, and in particular if it increases its productivity, then ordinary employees should share in that. It shouldn't all go into the pockets of the major shareholders, managers and directors. It shouldn't all be swallowed up by gigantic bonus payments for people at the top. The employees have a right to share in the increased profits and productivity. Now, the great strength of this scheme is not only its democratic and social justice elements, but it also incentivizes and rewards employees for economic success. 
So the more productive and profitable a company is, the more shares it will be required to issue to its members. And they will, over time, gradually through their share ownership issue, gain greater power and influence in the boardroom. They'll be able to use their leverage as share owners to influence the board. So it's another way in which the voices of ordinary employees can be heard in the boardroom and can influence decisions there. And of course, it will also greatly encourage employees to resolve issues with management rather than just simply going on strike. Of course, they have a right to go on strike if that's the ultimate necessary action, but if employees have direct representation on the boards of companies, if they've got share ownership, which gives them influence on the board, uh, board of the company, they will be able to take their case directly to the management. They'll be able to resolve the issues. And because they have a stake, they will be, I believe, more productive employees. They'll improve their productivity, which will benefit them, because they will gain from it. It will benefit their firms, and it will benefit the whole economy. It's a win-win for everyone. Now, as well as redistributing economic power in favour of employees and the wider public, these four elements of a new economic governance would reduce the likelihood of a rerun of the economic crisis we've been going through since 2008. It wouldn't guarantee that there'll never be a repeat, but it would very significantly reduce that likelihood. And I'm sure you're all aware our economy, even today, is still very fragile. There is a serious risk of another 2008-type crisis. There's a serious risk of a major economic meltdown, not just in Britain, but globally. We need to act preemptively to ensure that doesn't happen. And these four measures can be part of the answer. Perhaps not the whole answer, but part of the answer as to how we can avoid that. And they all have a number of key common elements. They decentralise economic power, they democratise economic decision making, they improve corporate social responsibility, and they strengthen the accountability of businesses to their employees and to consumers. This transcendence of elitist, <coughs> concentrated, an autocratic economic power would, I believe, result in a future society with a more democratic, cooperative, and accountable economy, and a more prosperous and productive economy to boot. So my question is, why can't we imagine it? Why can't we make it happen? I go back to my starting point. If we insist upon political democracy, why not economic democracy too? Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Peter. Um, we've got time for um, Q&A, um, so if anyone wants to ask any questions, then or make contributions, or, make or disagree, or criticise me, it's your call. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In the white. Um, would you prefer it if this was sort of enforcing on companies, or if they adopted it in terms of like profit, moral, as John Lewis has done? So I think there are really good models of like other companies, and that's the performance. And Could you shout out your question? Sorry, I'll get a knife. Um, yeah. Would you prefer it if this was legally enforced on companies, or if it was adopted in terms of like profit motive like John Lewis has done? I think a voluntary adoption would be great, but I can't see it happening. <laughs> the John, model, John Lewis model has been there, and it's been adopted by very few others. So I think there doesn't need to be a statutory underpinning. And, you know, companies may initially scream blue murder, but I think they'll get used to it. And I think in the long run, 
they're actually fine, it is actually to their interests as well as the employee's and consumer's interests. Any more questions? Yeah. So these, yeah, sorry, you yeah. about this in terms of representation of employees. So you speak a bit about the North as well. So in the deindustrialized North, there are a lot of areas where, say, 30 years ago, a person would have had a long term job where you would have been represented either in a union or in some other way. Now it's kind of like the uh, working in the supermarket or a call centre, which isn't bad in itself, but they're not getting anywhere near the representation. And often, when I speak to people about things like that, they say, "Well, why pay into a union, or why you know, there'd be no point." How how do you think we would go about convincing people that it's worth it? Because often there's, you know, I don't want to say hopelessness, but a sense that you know people should just kind of get on with the work and in that sort of line, in that sort of work. Sorry, you're not gonna you're not gonna really regard it very well because you're a disposable asset. I, my starting point is, without trade unions, we'd be still working in dark satanic mills. You know, every gain for employees over the years, from annual holiday pay to sickness leave to pensions, was fought for and won by trade unions. So trade unions are a vital part of the welfare system that we have today. And I don't think today the unions have always been their best sort of ambassadors. Um, because sometimes the unions come across as being very much focused on their own selfish concerns. I don't think it's selfish to demand you know, better wages and conditions, health and safety at work, equal rights for women in the workplace. I don't think they're selfish, but some people see it that way. I think if the unions embrace this kind of agenda, the unions would again be seen as the great force for social progress and inclusion in our society. And I think, you know, if you pay in, you know, a pound or two a week and you get back really substantive benefits, that's a very, very good investment. You know, it, it, it's very, very good. And, you know, even today, I, 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 my foundation, we run a help and casework advice line and sometimes we get cases of employees who have been victimised in the workplace. And the first thing we say is, are you in a trade union? Have you gone to your trade union? And some have never even thought about it. They've been paying into the trade union. They haven't realised all the benefits their trade union gives them. So in several cases recently, we've put the employee in touch with their trade union, and the trade union has funded the, their legal case against the employer. And, they, and, and two cases, two are still pending, but one, two cases, they actually won. So trade unions are a lot of good stuff, often not recognised, but I think this kind of agenda would certainly, I think, make being part of a trade union a good positive thing. And of course, trade unions can play a crucial role in setting up employee mutual societies and obviously lobbying to get their representatives elected to those bodies to represent their employees in their workplace. Yes, so um, you talk about a lot of these problems, how it's still not fair, the economic system. Can you see, especially after our 2008 crisis, any change, any hope, maybe from size of the <coughs> unions or something, going in the direction of making the economy more fair in the future? Not really. <laughs> I hate to be a pessimist, but it is really sad how even on the left, and among trade unions, these ideas are not being discussed, let alone campaigned for. It was, of course, a great irony <coughs> that Theresa May, when she became Conservative Prime Minister, one of the first things that she suggested was employee directors on the boards of companies. Of course, she never did anything about it, but the fact she even made the point in public on the, I think on the very day she became Prime Minister, that was saying something. Jeremy Corbyn's never said it. I'm a great fan of Jeremy Corbyn, but I'm sorry, he's not pushing for any of these ideas either. And this is the great irony, you know. Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, I've known them for 40 years. Uh, I've worked with them. I want to see a Labour government. But all their policies are about increased public spending, better spending on the health service, education, affordable housing, etc. None of their policy is about changing the structure of the economy, to change decision-making, 
to democratise in the way that I've discussed. They haven't got any of these ideas at all. So, of course, in my opinion, a Labour government led by Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald would be far better than a Conservative or a Liberal Democrat one. But I think they've fa so far fundamentally failed to propose anything that changes the fundamental structure of the economy, which is the root cause of so many of our problems. <coughs> so if you're on the Labour Party, please lobby the <coughs> Labour MPs to get Labour to talk about these ideas, to make economic democracy one of Labour's commitments. Is there enough one behind? Well, it could be. It depends how serious they are. Like some companies do have employee stock options, but they're tiny, they're minuscule. At the end of the day, even if all those employees banded together, they still have negligible impact. Plus, the way that companies often do it is by, you know, giving <coughs> X five shares, Y five shares. What needs to be is a system where this is held collectively because it's the collective strength of share ownership that will give real leverage. So if everybody in this room owns shares, all, we all, have, our, all, all have our own individual shares, uh, we haven't got much power. But if all of us held our shares in common with all the other students in every university and college in Britain and all the trade unions in Britain, then together we would have a lot of power. So it's that collective action, collective ownership and action, which I think is really key, to effective intervention in the economy. Um, do you believe that there's any danger in trade unions having too much power? Because obviously we saw in the 70s the um, damage that can be done with excessive union power. And maybe Thatcher went too far, some would argue she did. Um, but what do you think? Do you think she went a bit too far? Or do you think trade unions should be given free reign uh, to do as they please? Well, of course, right now, Capital has free reign to do what it pleases. You know, big business can do whatever it wants. Employees have no meaningful say or power at all. So these ideas are about trying to remedy that imbalance, to make it a more co-equal thing. Um, and whether that is done through trade unions or through employee mutual societies, I think it's a combination of both. But, you know, historically, uh, overall, leaving aside particular examples, Trade unions have been of great benefit to ordinary people. You know, trade unions led the campaign to end child labour, to establish the eight hour day. All these things that we now take for granted were fought for originally by trade unions. And I would just say to my trade union friends and allies, you need to recapture that imaginative, radical spirit of the past to come up with a new agenda that makes trade unions relevant today, that gives people a sense that what unions want is in the public interest. There's not a sectional interest, although of course individual unions fight their own battles, but it's a collective interest for the wider public. In Australia, in the 1970s, it was the trade unions that led the Green Bands movement. This is a movement, <coughs> alliance between the trade unions and the Green movement against speculative office and luxury housing development, particularly around Sydney, and the carving up of green areas. The trade unions worked with the Greens to say, we are not going to support these environmentally damaging policies. We are not going to supply any labour to contract on these sites. So they refused to work on these sites and prevented, not all, but a lot, of the speculative and very damaging developments that big business was trying to impose on inner city Sydney. That's a really good example of how trade unions can use their leverage in a way that is socially responsible and which can also be of great social benefit. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how your idea of beneficial to preventing the financial crisis. I mean, obviously one of the major problems was that assets that, that seemed to be the same turned out not to be safe. So I, I'm kind of critical of the idea that it's only because of the bankers were too risk-loving and kind of didn't have to take personal responsibility for those things. And uh, 
the communist system then? Because then surely it'll be even more productive. Why don't we just go that far? Well, I think um, that kind of system goes too far the other way. I mean, communist systems have been based upon state control, not employee power. And even in this country, if you look at our nationalised industries, you know, we have national industries like British Telecom, uh, British Gas, and British Rail. They were held by the state, they were under public ownership, but they were run like private corporations. The bosses of British Rail and British Telecom had the same powers and acted in the same way as if they were private owners. They had hugely inflated salaries and they made all the decisions. The employees of British Rail and British Telecom had no say. So I think that's a, a very bad model. I don't think the issue is so much ownership as control. What's really important is not who owns the enterprise, although that might, that might be a good thing if it's in public interest ownership. What's really important is that employees and consumers have a degree of control over both public and private institutions. That's the best guarantor against the kind of autocratic system that traditional communism uh, <coughs> pursued. And yeah, one more thing. Um, I want to ask them about free speech because I saw you gave you gave a talk at Oxford Union on um, so you were in favour of um, I think it was the House um, Union not being a safe space. And I was wondering um, why. You know, what is it for you that in particular makes you want to argue that case? I think a lot of Warwick in particular is facing a lot of. Um, we've, even we've had trouble this year from trying to get various speakers in because they may not meet the sort of criteria that um, the uni wants us to wants us to meet and you know, how do you sort of get that argument across um, what would you say is the best way to sort of tackle that sort of illiberal approach well I'm quite sympathetic to the principle that some people should be no platform so when I was in the National Union students in the 1970s I campaigned to stop the far right British National Party and before that the National Front from being given a platform in universities. Because they were openly going around immigrant communities and terrorizing people. And that, to me, crossed a red line. I didn't try to stop or no platform right wingers, but people who were espousing neo Nazi, fascist, and racist ideas, and whose organizations were actively involved in intimidating and terrorizing immigrant communities, I felt it was legitimate to deny them the right to speak on campus. I'm also sympathetic to the principle of safe spaces. I don't think any black student should be required to, or forced, or have to put up with a, a student meeting where they're being racially abused, or intimidated, or where they're not being given a voice. But on both those issues, I think sometimes it's been misinterpreted in a, in a way that's too wide and sweeping. So my friend, Mary Namazi, uh, some years ago, there was an attempt to ban her from speaking here at Warwick on the grounds that she was Islamophobic. Well, she is an Iranian communist feminist uh, who has seen firsthand the horrors of Islamist rule in Iran. And she was speaking out against Islamist extremism. She wasn't attacking Muslim people, she defends Muslims. Yet there was an attempt to ban her. And that was quite clearly an abuse of the no platform safe space policy. Um, I think there's only three instances where it's legitimate to deny someone free speech. First, if they make false, damaging, malicious allegations, like saying X is a paedophile, a tax fraudster, or a rapist. False, damaging allegations like that have no place in free and open debate. Secondly, if they engage in threats, menaces, and harassment. Again, that's an abuse of free speech. And thirdly, if they incite violence, like the National Front and the BNP have done in the past, and the EDL and others have done in the past, and even Britain First and the present. Those are not legitimate exercises of free speech because they close down free and open debate. If you're being threatened and menaced and whatever, harassed, if you're having false allegations thrown against you, 
you won't feel able to participate in a free and open debate because you'll be intimidated and afraid. And that drives people away. So back in the 10 or 15 years ago, when some Jamaican reggae and dancehall artists were openly putting out songs advocating the killing of LGBT people, um, a lot of black LGBT people were so intimidated, they didn't dare attend any public debates because they feared being attacked by supporters of these groups, these singers, performers, like Boju Banton, Elephant Man, Vibes Cartel. They wanted to debate them, but they were afraid because they felt threatened. So there was no genuine free and open debate. So in those circumstances, I think you know, we have to say that it is right that we protest people whose views we disagree with, but we don't seek to ban them unless they follow or, or overstep the mark on those three instances. For example, I, I've defended Christian street preachers who have said homosexuality is sinful and immoral. I don't agree with them one iota, but I don't think they should be banned from speaking or arrested. And some of them have been arrested in this country for simply saying homosexuality is immoral. Well, of course they're wrong, <coughs> homophobic, but they have a right to hold their view, providing they don't threaten, menace, or intimidate, or incite violence. And the best way to deal with those arguments is by challenging those people, by protesting them, by counter-argument, by evidence, by calling them out in the public square. That's the best way to defeat homophobia, not by the bureaucratic means of banning them.
of Zanu's political program from 1972. No liberal progressive person could disagree with the word in it. He talked about free and fair elections, free press, the right to protest, all those things. And I believe they did believe in it initially. But of course, Mugabe's betrayed all that. And the sad thing is that <coughs> the man who started off as a liberation hero has turned into a tyrant. Now, Robert Mugabe has killed more black Africans than even the repressive evil white minority regime of Ian Smith in what was then Rhodesia, and even more than P.W. Bota in South Africa. Some of you may know your history. In 1960, in South Africa, the apartheid police massacred 69 black Africans who were protesting against the past laws. They were shot down in cold blood. The whole world was outraged. And that was an outrage. But in one small region of Zimbabwe, between 1983 and 1985, President Mugabe's forces massacred 20,000 black Africans because they came from a region that had voted for the other opposition leader, Joshua Nkomo, who was also part of the liberation struggle. <coughs> now that 20,000, that's the equivalent of a Sharpeville massacre every day for more than nine months. <coughs> And most of the world just looked the other way. Mugabe and Mnangagwa have blood on their hands. They were both involved in those massacres in Masculineland and the Midlands in the 1980s. And I think the victims deserve justice. Well, thank you very much for your just another round of applause. I say, if any of you are interested, um, as I mentioned, I run a small human rights foundation. Um, so leaflets here about it. On the back, it tells you how to sign up to receive our email bulletins. Uh, totally free, no charge. So take one if you're interested. You sign up on the back. And we do a lot of really below the radar stuff about human rights campaigns around the world. Like, who knows about the persecution of the Kalash in Pakistan? Only 4,000 Kalash people are left because they've been terrorized by the Sunni Muslims and Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Only 4,000 of this tribe are surviving. We publicized that a few weeks ago. We did a big report about women's rights in Pakistan, talking about some of the extreme violence and discrimination against women in Pakistan. So if you're interested in these kinds of things, where well, I work on democracy in Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, supporting liberation struggles against Indonesia's occupation of West Papua, or Pakistan's occupation of Balochistan, please take one, you'll find it really interesting. But thank you so much, and good luck with your studies.